Back at it, Christopher. Here we are in, in the, the house. den of inequity. It's really tore apart in here. <laughs> what did you do? We are doing some serious renovation work in here on our new podcast studio. We are. That's and good. Well, no, I shouldn't say we, because yeah, I have not helped I in the slightest. I am doing some renovation <laughs> And I probably work. won't help in the slightest. So this room is a complete disaster, and the other room's even worse. I appreciate all of your work. So we're in close quarters here, recording at my desk. Yeah, and we are very close to each other, closer than normal, but I like it. It's cozy. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's pretty exciting. I mean, by maybe next week when we record, we'll have our studio up. We should. Right? Or maybe the week after. I mean, but, relatively put yeah. together. I yeah. guess I don't know how much work you're going to do during the week, but as much as you want. <laughs> <laughs> Chances are, yeah, probably quite a bit. You think so? This will probably be all done. By next Thursday. Really? You yeah. got a little kitchenette set up over there? Yeah, I'm putting a kitchenette in. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Isn't that what they call it? Like in a like a small apartment or a... Yeah, it's going to have a mini fridge and a microwave. Wow. And a sink. You're on the up and up. It's pretty exciting. <laughs> it is. Eye trees, big time. Um, Jerry, I don't know if you know, but we got something really exciting other than our new podcast studio that's ha- coming up. Really? As well. Yeah. What? It's called Snarf madness yes i was going to post something about that this week and forgot oh well you really need to do that i know we do because people need those brackets the deadline is closing uh to get your brackets in if you go to snarfcomics.com slash madness you can download the bracket or you can just go to snarfcomics.com and in the top uh there will be a link for snarf madness just click that and you'll be able to download the PDF bracket. Correct. Um, from there, you can f- print it and fill it out. I can guarantee you it will be available to people before this episode comes out. Because it's available right now. It is. And we it's just been haven't... available for a week and a half now. It has. We just haven't let anybody know. <laughs> but I'm going to let people know before this podcast comes yes. out. Yes. Um, so definitely fill that out. And you need to uh, print it or somehow fill it out. Uh, on the computer, email it back I don't know to how us. it happens, but <laughs> <laughs> scan it, email it to info at snarfcomics.com, or you can uh, take a picture of it, text it to us. But I, um, if you don't know this, there's an app for your phone called Microsoft Office Lens. It's mm. free. Wow. You can take a picture of it and it'll turn it into a PDF and you can email it right from your phone to info at snarfcomics.com. What are we doing this year for Snarf Madness, Jerry? Ooh, it's all characters like yes. comic book characters there are other i guess there are other than comic book characters right Mm-mm. there isn't they're all comic book characters. oh they're all comic book yep. characters i guess i didn't realize you took all of them off yeah i guess that's okay um so yeah they're all comic book characters you will it's not about their strength or power it's about who you would like better but it's not you right it's chris and i the goal is to match Jerry or I's bracket. There will be two winners, whoever's closest to Jerry's bracket, whoever's closest to my bracket. If we both have identical brackets, then there'll be one winner who will yeah. win double the prizes. I can guarantee you we're not going That's to have identical like, brackets. got to be a statistical impossibility, right? Almost. That, and I know we have different yeah. likes. Um, so. Well, so anyway, yes, like you said, it is not a who beats who in a fight. Right. If... And you know, if I'm looking, if I'm looking inward towards myself, I may make some choices that people won't expect. Yeah. Well, how are you going to judge? Let's give uh, the listeners, the people that are skipping the podcast and just going to put in their bracket. Yeah. Let's give our listeners a little bit of insight on how they can choose better. Okay. How are you going to base your decisions? Is it just going to be a a purely, I like this guy better, or is it going to be an amalgamation of, um, who you think is the superior character for... I think it is. It is going to be that. I think the superior character... I'm not... Again, it's not like their strength or who would win in a fight by any means, but the superior character in, like, story, um, who is generally liked better, in my mind, you know, like... I don't know. There are a lot of characters that people enjoy, like... Let's say I'm just going to use one right off the top, like Superman. A lot of tons of people enjoy Superman 
to the fullest, right? That doesn't necessarily mean I enjoy Superman to the fullest. So you are basically going by so, your personal preference. I don't know. I, I think don't know I'm if gonna, I'm going. It depends on who they're matched up against, really. Yeah. I, I mean, I will most likely I will go by personal preference, but there are the slight chance where I see somebody that I just feel like has you better just story or respect for. Yes. You're like, hey, you know what? That's a good I word like this for it. person better, but as a character, I have to go with this person because I respect their contribution to pop culture. Yeah, I agree. I'm going to do that too as well. I'll, I'll probably definitely, it'll be tinged with this is who the, I enjoy personally better. Um, but for the most part, I'm going to try and base my opinions on who I think, who is the better character as far as um, longevity, story, um, contribution to pop culture. Because there's already one. I haven't ranked anything yet, but there's already one um, like matchup, if you will, that I believe both characters deserve a second round. But you can't go. Can't and, have it. and I can't have it. So I am going to absolutely pick the character that I feel is like has a a better name i guess a better um more like, gravitas yeah like m- more story uh more known more known in my mind i guess there the other character is like really good and he's got a show coming up pretty soon um that i really want to see and i really like the character but he's going to get beat i think uh, well we'll have to wait and see um so like i said download the bracket uh, fill it out. Get it back to us. Info at snarfcomics.com. How much does it cost to be a part of the Snarf Madness Bracket Challenge? Nothing. Zero. Cost you nothing. Not but you can penny. win like $200 worth of prizes and gift tr- cards. And a trophy. Yeah, and a trophy. You're going to win a trophy. Now, it's a tro- a revolving trophy, right? Like you got to give it to the next year's winner. Is it? I don't know. We'll figure that out. I thought everybody would just get a trophy for the year. That's how like f- fantasy football works. You know, you got to... A revolving I trophy. Know, but what if somebody wins in London? Okay. All right. Well, you'll win a trophy. <laughs> so we'll have trophies each year. We'll have like 2020 trophies. We had recent listeners in London. I don't know if you know this. No, I didn't. Well, that's why I'm bringing them Hello, up. Hello, London. Yeah. Thank you, UK. Um, so yes, we will have a trophy. You will get some t-shirts, stickers, of course. You will also get um, a bundle of snarf, one-time bundle of snarf. Yes. Um, and you will get a gift card to we'll announce it later it'll be a mystery gift card yeah you're gonna get something you'll get a mystery gift card of at least five hundred dollars fifty to a hundred dollars right somewhere in that range <laughs> i'm glad it's not 500 is it a 50 dollar gift card yes because we're gonna do one to each winner so right there'll be two winners hundred dollars total fifty dollars for each winner. yeah yes. plus your bundle of snarf and t-shirts and whatnot right so um you definitely want to be involved and the way you do it is you listen every week, every week through March and into April. We will do one round and we will give our picks and yes. all of that jazz and you will play along and score. And it's uh, just it's a fantastic just a time. just a nanny. Yeah, it is. I've it's really, one. last year we did it and it was amazing. It was so fun. It was we did really it. fun. Best pop uh, sci-fi uh, fantasy movies of the last 10 years was yes. last year. Yep. Although they had a bunch of movies left out. They had a lot of movies left out. So this year we still fun either way, like whatever's in the bracket, that's what you're scoring. So it's, it's fun. And you know, we sit there and talk about the matchups and the characters and why we like them. And yes, it's it's a good time. So definitely do that. Also next week, next Friday, did you know, Jerry, that we will be attending C2E2 in Chicago? I was just talking about it to my wife. Yeah. We'll be at C2E2. We will be giving out uh, stickers and all kinds of good stuff. We will be, um meeting and greeting yeah and you know who we're gonna be meeting who a certain artist that uh has done a logo for us oh uh that would be eric macias yeah he's going to be there he does caricatures um, oh man he does amazing characters last last year he did a caricature of me and jerry as that Jack- we really haven't put out <laughs> uh, for wide you know publication for people to see like <laughs> he did it's... a pic a caricature of us in character as comic book characters jerry I was, was batman of course i was daredevil of course and we were posed on the front of the titanic like rose and jack to be fair this is exactly what we asked for. <laughs> <laughs> we asked for this drawing he provided the exact drawing we asked for 
and it is very good. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, we he also added a goat, which obviously, if you follow along with Snarf, you know that we have a goat in our logo. He added a goat in the background that we absolutely fell in love with and want that goat as our logo, the one he drew. Um, and we are receiving that. He's yeah, doing that. He's for doing us. it for us. Um, and it's absolutely wonderful. So uh, check him out if you're going to go to C two E two. Obviously, go find him and get a caricature drawn. Caricature drawn. Um, yeah, it's but, not that expensive, um, and he does no, some custom. Like he will draw you as a whatever you whatever. want. Whatever. Um, but also look him up on Instagram at what is it? E E M A N M A C I A S. Oh. Iman Macias. Yes. 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 Um, and uh, he is also he works as a uh, sketch or. Um, caricaturist yes i was gonna try to say something different but I think uh, you're right. for uh the booth is uh sketched and um he goes around to different uh to different conventions and does that but he also does other caricature work on, on uh, in chicago in the chicago area and travels all around the united states doing that kind of stuff so um definitely you know, the thing to do would be to check him out on facebook and instagram yes and that'd be Eric, E-R-I-C-K, Macias, M-A-C-I-A-S. Um, so check out his work. We'll be posting. He sent us a bunch of caricatures that he drew. He did a Wolverine. There's a Venom and a Galactus here. So we're going to post them on They're our really, Instagram really this week to kind of promote. And if you are going to be at C2E2 uh, by chance, uh, definitely stop by and let him know that you heard about him from us. And yeah. we would appreciate that. And look for us. Yeah, and we'll be there on Friday. Friday. Only. Because yep. we both screwed up and we can't go on Saturday. Correct. <laughs> Saturday, I'll be watching monster trucks. Yeah, you will be watching monster trucks, and I will be um, limoing about town. Limoing about town. Yeah, going Is to fancy thing? restaurants. <laughs> Wish I was a one percenter. <laughs> Golly. Uh, so, what are we doing here, Chris? Do we do news first? Do we do what we're watching first? Do we do? whatever you want to do first because um, it's usually your choice <laughs> well uh i thought we could do start off by doing a little bit of a review and i know we were going to do it last week we ran out of time but a little bit of a review of star wars galaxy's edge what you meant to say is we ran off the rails <laughs> because i believe that's the case yes but we didn't get a chance and uh i figured i i know I, i've spent a couple weeks since i was at disney but we could uh do it I, now i want to know about it Yes. For um, sure. What do you want to know, Jerry? I want to know everything. <laughs> I want to know your, like, were you, like, absolutely, like, submerged into the world of Star Wars? Did you feel like a Star Wars character? Did you feel like you were in the actual galaxy of the Star Wars realm? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely unbelievable. First off, it's, um, it's if you're not aware, it, uh, they did it in Disneyland in California, but right. I was at... Um, in Florida at Disney World at Hollywood Studios, and they built this whole Star Wars Galaxy's Edge is what it's called, and it's an outpost basically, like a okay. almost on like a I think the planet is called Batu, but. but it's not it's original just for this okay like it's not from something boy it sounds good and uh, I think it's Black something outpost Black anyway. Canary oh she's good. <laughs> So it's an outpost. Uh, the the uh, basically we got there about an hour and a half early. They have this. They have two rides in this mm -hmm. land: the Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run, okay, and then uh, Rise of the Resistance, which literally just opened like a couple weeks before we got there, or nice. like a month before we got there. And I don't even think it's open in California yet. Oh, really? So that's a first. I'm like, we got to get there super early um, and get this all figured out. Well, it turns out. Um, it's interesting because there's no standby line to get on Rise of the Resistance. There's no fast passes. There's none of that. You just wait. You get into the park, and you have to be in the park when it opens. Your entire party has to be inside the park. you got to scan in, give them your fingerprint. That's how you get into parks. you got to fingerprint in. Wow. Did you know that? I did not. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty serious. Um, to get in the park. Once you're in the park, you're able to join what's called a boarding group or a boarding party. Okay. Um, so the boarding party sign up opens at park open eight o'clock in our case. Um, and that's the only way you can ride the ride. That's it. 
when you get a boarding group, um, they're, they go by your boarding group, one, two, three, four, five. They only, I don't know how many they do in a day, but not that many. Um, and when they call your boarding group, you get two hour window. You got to get to that ride and you don't have to wait in any line. You just go, go on the ride. I mean, there's about a, you have two hours to show up. Yeah. You show up in your two hour window that they tell you. Oh, I see. You're not all going at the same time. What do you mean? Like you, I thought you meant like the boarding group would be all going on the ride at the exact same yeah, time. They are. So you have to wait two hours for the entire boarding group to get there. No, no, no. Once they call your boarding group, like yes. you're in boarding group number five. Yes. You, your entire party is in that boarding group and you have a two hour window from when they call your boarding group till the end of your window. Okay. I was thinking a boarding group would be more than just your family. It is. It's a bunch of people. Like however many people are in a boarding group, I have no idea. I know. So 100? like if you know. get there at the beginning of that two hour window and you're waiting for like two people, you could wait for up to two hours for those people to get there. I'm, right? not, I'm not following you. You said you have a two hour window yeah. to get there to ride the ride. Yeah. If you arrive right away, you're right by the ride, let's say. Yeah. Right by there. You can ride it. Without the other people. Yeah. Uh, okay. That's a what I was The boarding group is a chunk of people that get to ride the ride at this specified time. I gotcha. I thought you meant it all went at the same time. Like you all had to board as a group. I mean, you can if you're all there at the same time. Yeah. But it doesn't have to be that way. No. You okay. just have a two hour window to get there. Gotcha. Anyway. So, but the good part about that is, I mean... The good part is you basically go there, you check in, and you don't really wait in line. I mean, yeah, you don't it, have takes, to stand it still takes about 30 minutes to go through the queue because, I mean, there's other people in the boarding group that are going to show up at the same time as you. Yeah. And there's overlapping boarding groups because they're two-hour windows. Um, but it's minimal, the wait time to get on. So it's great in that respect. The downside is if you aren't at the park on the app getting onto a boarding group at 8 o'clock when the park opens... By 8.01, they're all gone for the entire day. At that, yeah, at that time that you were there. I mean, like... It'll be like that for a while. Yeah. Yes. In two years, it might not be that way. At some point here in the very near future, they're going to open it up to the queue lines and the fast passes. Just, it's right now the demand is so high. Yeah. And they're having a lot of technical difficulties with the ride. Because it is... That sucks. um, It is a... Okay, I'll just start with that ride, Rise of the Resistance. Rise of the Resistance. And I'm trying to not, like, I, it's one of those things, like, you don't want to give away too much. Because okay. it's not as much a ride, although there are components of the experience that are a ride. But it is an experience from the beginning to the end. Really? From the queue line, waiting in line, just the atmosphere that you're in. Yeah. And the props and stuff you see going through that line is, and it builds a narrative as really? you go through um just based on the detail of the environment that you're in and then you get on go into a room and then there's you know things happening yes that you're paying attention to you <laughs> yeah. know there's storyline playing out that you're you know you're witnessing yes and then you go from that room and the door is open. And first of all, all of the workers on this are, they're like in character. They're like actors. Of course. And then you get rushed along to the next area where you go through another environment that's incredible outside and into the next element of the ride, which is a, another interactive ride experience. Yes. That you then go through. When that's over, the doors open and you are in another element. You're, I'll just oh say this gosh. part. When those doors open, you are inside of a Star Destroyer. Okay. Um, and there's a whole interactive experience that happens there. Then you move into another area where you are filed into groups and by ride workers that are in character as Imperial officers to go to interrogation. From there, you go into another room where you experience another interactive scenario okay and then from there you get rushed out of that by actors into the actual ride so all of that happens oh before you get on the ride yeah that's the 30 minutes it's 30 minutes eh, ish 
and there's some waiting and, and a couple little lines along the way. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's the whole experience is, you know, 30 to 40 minute, ex- probably 30 minute experience. That's pretty cool. And then you get on the actual ride itself and you know, it's relatively short as rides are, but still the things that are going on in there are, you know, it's not a thrill ride. No, it's more of a, a it's story that more, you're living. Yes. Like you're, it's more of an interactive experience um, with, you know, kind of a ride feature at the end. You're in part of a Star Wars story. Pretty much. But don't expect, you know, Tower of Terror or a roller coaster. Oh, it's no, not no, that. No, yeah, you know, yeah. it's not that kind of a ride. Now, whoops. The actual ride component is fun, but it's not a, you know, and, and that's how Disney is a lot of it. It's yeah. not thrill rides you know it's uh environments it's attention to detail it's those types of things which you can appreciate yeah you do you appreciate that more than just a roller coaster right you know what i mean so the first day we got there and we you know within 20 seconds i got a boarding group for late morning probably um but so we went over to the gates we were there an hour early hour and a half early at the park so they follow you into the gates to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Mm-hmm. When the park opens, then you go in and basically you go straight to um, Millennium Falcon Smuggler's Run ride. And that is, um, that's the other main attraction there. And that is, that's the one that you've probably seen a little bit about where you actually get to fly the Millennium Falcon. Yes. And you're and you in get- a crew, you know, a cockpit of six people is all per cockpit. Okay. And there's two pilots, two gunners two engineers and you all have little tasks you got to do. Um, and it was a fun ride and it mainly the queue line through it was really great. Cause there's okay. stuff to look at and the environment again is amazing. But then you actually get into the area of the millennium Falcon where they got like the, ch- the, the board, you yeah. know, in the seats. Yes. And, um, then you file into the actual cockpit for the ride. The ride itself is, it's fun. Um, I probably the fun that you have on it, is going to be pretty correlated with who you have in your party because the things you do actually do affect the experience. Oh, they do. Yeah. The pilots actually affect what the ride feels like. Wow. Like if they're running into walls, you're going to feel, feel that. that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and in our case, they put cat, you know, they put a six year old and a four year old in the pilot seat. So there was a lot of running in. Of things. course. Yes. <laughs> For the other people is a lot of kind of just button pushing and whatnot, but there actually is a task to the game, and if you achieve that, you actually get graded and you get a score. Really? Yeah. What was your score? Um, not great. Scoundrel. That was her. Oh, you. S- <laughs> At least it wasn't a scruffy ner- looking nerf her. No, but that one was fun. It was fun. It was really cool stepping on board the Millennium Falcon and taking pictures. And, yeah, for sure. And the queue line through it was awesome. Um, you know, I, I honestly believe I would feel like that's the best part of it for me. Like you see it on on the movie all the time, but stepping into the world and being in that space. I mean, I know it's, you know where it's where it is, and you're like on a ride and whatnot. But it looks like what you've seen since yeah. you were a child. Yeah, and we only went on that one once. I mean, I feel like uh, you should have done it again. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I definitely should have. But you know, it's one of those, and that one you can wait in line. We were there so early that we basically walked right on. Um, but you know, later on the day there was, I wouldn't wait an hour. <laughs> really? Yeah. But, um, later on in the day, like at night, you can get down to like was 30 it, minute waits. Was it short? Yeah, it's pretty short. It is. They're all short. Well, I mean, 30 to 40 minute experiences. That one's the exception. Short. That one's the exception. Yeah. Um, there is a, a couple, there is one, uh, room that you go in before you get in the Millennium Falcon that is kind of a show interactive animatronic thing okay so that's pretty cool but you know like rides aside that's not the main that's what i was just going to ask is uh so those are the two rides i guess you call those are them. The two like headline attractions you would what's call the rest of the park the rest of the galaxy's edge is it's absolutely amazing i mean it's they've really outdone themselves disney in this one i mean the last kind of big thing they did was pandora Yes. In Animal Kingdom, which is absolutely unbelievably stunning. It's like insane to even look at really? walking through it. Um, how 
they made these floating mountains that are hundreds of feet high in the air with waterfalls falling from one to the other to the other down to the ground. It's it's absolute insanity. <laughs> That's um, awesome. And you don't think like they could do anything better, better than, than that. that. Uh, and then you get it to Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. And the attention to detail is so un- unbelievable because when you're outside in the gates waiting to go in, um, you kind of have to go through like a cave-like tunnel to enter into Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. Okay. But and you're and on the other side, you're at Hollywood Studios, so you're basically on like Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. Like a street. Mm-hmm. Once you walk through that tunnel... They have designed it so you cannot see outside of Star Wars Galaxy's Edge. You can't see the other park. You can't see the roads. You can't see anything. Yeah, you're the whole outside of it submersed. is a mountain. You know, it's a mountain range that they've created. Yep, mountains that jump way up into the air, um, and every single little thing, every building, everything is meticulously detailed. So they've moved actual mountains into this place <laughs> yeah. and placed them there. That's Looks inc- like it. It's incredible. <laughs> No, it's 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 kind of the spires. I think Black Spire Outpost. That's what it's called. Oh, it's like mod. Kind of like you know, out in Utah, it's got those like narrow spire mountains. Yeah, plateaus, um, if you will. No, not really plateaus. They don't. They don't. No. They're not flat. No. Oh. They're like spikes. That go oh, up like sounds like a real here. spire. <laughs> so you kind of go around the outside. Um, in the other direction, you enter from Toy Story World, which is their other newest world, which is kind of a letdown be honest oh no it's pretty small but anyway you go in um i'll just stay the area where you walk like kind of the end of star wars galaxies or the central hub i should say is where smugglers run in where they have a full-size millennium falcon yeah right there um and the mountains all around it it's absolutely unbelievable you can't i mean we i probably we probably spent an entire day just in galaxy's edge and then two days later we went back and probably spent another half day and you don't get sick of walking to the area with the Millennium Falcon with the mountains around it. It's really? unbelievable. You're just looking at it. I mean, it, I like, saw the pictures of it, but I know that on? doesn't do any justice to where you're but at. But that's not everything. I mean, once before you get into that area, there's this whole area with like uh, an Imperial ship. I guess it's Kylo Ren's ship. Oh, really? size That's parked. And it's actually a stage. So later on in the day, they'll have Imperial officers go up there and, dance. and start like, <laughs> yeah, they do a dance. No, they... Um, you know, people gather around. They're like, we're looking for a spy. And then they yeah. kind of, Kylo Ren comes out of his ship and they kind of walk around the crowd, like looking in nonstop stormtroopers everywhere, just walking around everywhere, oh, that's causing cool. all kinds of mischief. Um, so there's that kind of that whole area. Uh, that's where the, the milk stand is, where they sell the blue and green milk. What's that like? Um, they're pretty good. It's not milk. They're like smoothies. Okay. They're not actually milk. Well, I didn't assume it was actual milk, but I just was wondering. We what had the it was blue like. milk. It's like a. It was like a tropical berry smoothie type thing. Oh, okay. I think they got some kind of coconut milk in them. But oh, I love coconut. <laughs> but you go back in that area. There's like a little droid station where they got a bunch of wrecked droids just sitting around, and that's cool. You go kind of around the outside. There's a bunch of droids just kind of in this area that's kind of like roped off. And you think they're just like, oh, they're, those are really cool droid statues. Let's go look at them. Yeah. And the kids will be just standing there looking at them. And you're like, oh, take a picture. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> you know, they start yeah. moving around. And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> um, so that's really cool. Um, there's a couple restaurants. Um, we uh, Docking Bay was like the indoor kind of restaurant. Um, they're all like counter service restaurants. Um, and that one was... None of the food, is, they don't have any normal food. It's all Star Wars y type food. Really? Yeah. Do you get that little like kit? Like, even that, there's no kids' meals. But do you get that little kit that uh, Luke has on the X Wing that he brings out when no, he goes but to the, Dagobah with the Yoda? bread in the meal that I had? I had like, it was basically like a beef short rib with some other stuff, mashed potatoes or something like that, and a roll that looked exactly like the one that Ray makes in that little. Yes. It looks exactly like it. Really? Yeah. So that was cool. Um, so we ate there. The food there was pretty mediocre. But to be in fairness, I was I was sick that day. Oh, like so I that sucks. Was like not. <laughs> just like trying not to puke while we were sitting there trying to eat. Really? <laughs> yeah. In a park that sucks. Um, but whatever. It's a real damper on the day. The other one is just kind of a quick service one called Ronto's Roaster. They only have one thing. It's like a pita with like a sausage and 
pork, um, like and coleslaw and stuff on it. It's amazing. Excellent. Sounds really, really good. good. And like yeah. some kind of sauce on it. Did you bring one of them back? Nope. I could take a picture of it though. Bring one back next time. And then adjacent to that, there's this couple really months cool, when you go again. Bring one back. Yeah. There's this really cool open air market that's kind of like in this kind of big hallway with big columns on the side. And the top is all these like banners across the top. Kind of really? like um, Aladdin. Kind of looks like that. Yeah. That's what it reminded me of when you yeah. just said it. It does. It looks, it has a very like Tatooine, like sand building feel to it. Yep. Um, and then there's just little shops in there. All nice. kinds of different little shops that have all kinds of different things. Like the, uh, is that kind of like the uh, Renaissance Fair? Like how they have little shops and places you can go in and actually buy things? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, they're more permanent shops, but I mean, it's not like vendors. Yeah. But It's not like that. Yeah, it is like that. It's meant to be like that. But okay. they're like, that's Disney what I mean. Shops. Like, yeah. no, I get it. I but just they don't mean... sell Disney merchandise like they've they've very carefully tried to curate this to be an exclusively star wars experience but you know like disney you can't, owns star wars right correct but you can't i'm saying you can't go buy a mickey mouse stuffed animal yeah. there no that's good um that's I mean, good. you can buy star wars stuffed animals no yeah i get it but that's good i think they should do it that way if they're going to give you like a very immersive experience why would you ever put you, something in there even that down doesn't... to the photographers we stopped to get a picture there's a full size x wing luke's x wing Awesome. And they have a photographer there. You can take pictures. And uh, we're trying to get Jet to pay attention. We're like, look for Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse is in the camera. Look in there. And the, even the photographer. The photographer. Yeah. Like, what the fuck do they care? Yeah. She's like, who's this Mickey Mouse everybody keeps talking about? Is that a womp rat? <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. That's some good training they got. For and then that. like the X-Wing. We're taking pictures in front of this X-Wing. You just think it's an X-Wing. Yeah. Sitting out there. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, smoke starts coming up from under it. And all of a sudden, Chewbacca and Ray walk out. And they're just like working on the X-Wing. And they have a little thing. They're just show. doing things. Yeah. <laughs> and then they'll just randomly so be walking cool. around, too. Which is not like... Disney doesn't really do that anymore. Now it's like you go to a designated area to meet a character. But Oh, they're not walking around the park anymore? Not really. Not really. But in Star Wars land, they are. Hmm. They are, which bullshit. is cool. And um, kind of bullshit, Disney. The other two <laughs> things we did there, um, we did the Savi's workshop, was where you build a lightsaber. Mm -hmm. But it's not just like go in a room and build a lightsaber. Like you make a, you make a, you have to make a reservation ahead of time. You go, <laughs> you go into this room where it is led by actors, and it's this whole multi, you know, it's this whole experience where you build a. You know, they give yeah. you all the speeches and they turn on the lights and they got effects going on. And you build the lightsaber and it's really cool. Really, really fun. I want to do that. And then we did the droid depot where you make a droid and they're pretty good size and they're actually remote control. Yes. I saw you playing around with one here in the office. And in that place is kind of cool too, because around the whole outside of the workshop is just a never ending like treadmill with all the droid parts on it and you just walk up to it and you just start picking the different parts you want oh really and then you go over to this station and they just got like uh electric screwdrivers hanging from the ceiling and you literally you know just put them screw together. It together yeah so any part you grab can be part of your droid there's two different models you can do like an r2 or a bb8 type oh okay that's what i was one. gonna say like you can't just pick random things and try to put it together no they're just basically the same parts but different colors gotcha or different styles because you have an R2. Yeah, you can unit. get to do like the dome head type or they got like the more triangle. Oh, they do. That's a... R4? R4, yeah. Something like that. Yeah, I think it is. So we did that. So it's cool. I mean, it's the attention to detail is what blows you away. Um, I still don't think like Pandora is still more like just knocks you out by like, especially because it's all plant-based. Everything's so green and tropical right. looking. But this is a lot bigger than Pandora. Size Are they real wise. plants? Some of them, most of them, but not all of them. Yeah. Um, I'd say this has got to be at least twice the size as Pandora, though. I mean, oh, it's, really? it's a it's big that area. Big? Yeah, it's a big area. Holy cow. It's 14, 15 acres. Really? Yeah. And and full of different buildings and walkways. and I mean, it's not huge. I mean, you can walk through it in 15 minutes if you're just booking around. But well, I mean, there's so many things to do and look at, though. I mean, I mean, there's if you're gonna go through all the shops and do the rides. I mean, there's not that much else to do other than um, 
the work, you know, the building lightsaber, the droid, but you could have reservations for those. Yeah. Well, there's also the cantina bar, which we went to. That's what I was going to ask you about is how that was. The That was, it was really cool. I mean, we were there with a two-year-old and a four-year-old and a six-year-old. Yes. At like six o'clock. Okay. And the only place we could get, and we had a reservation, but we had to stand at the bar. So that was a little difficult. Yeah, that would be hard to do. But they have all kinds of crazy Star Wars-y drinks. Marley got this drink. It was like a pineapple-based drink, but it had the whole top of it was foam. And she drinks it. And like two minutes later, she's like, something's wrong with my mouth. And I'm like, oh, shit. You're having an like, allergic reaction? Yeah. She's like, my mouth's all tingly and burning and like numb. I'm like, what is going on? She's like, try this drink. And I tried it. And I'm like, I, nothing. And then like about five minutes later, it's almost like tingly and burning, but almost like pop rocks sensation. Okay. But numb. And then it doesn't go away. Like it lasts a long time. What was the drink? I, whatever that foam is, is what caused that. It was almost like some kind of a foamy salt. Weird. Weird. They uh, Another person had Did a drink. Did you ask anybody like yeah. if this oh, is yeah. supposed to happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I asked the bartender. I'm like... What is up with this? She's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what it does. She's like, it'll be fine in like 24 hours. I'm like, what? she was she was joking, oh. but it did last a while. Um, the person next to me got this drink, and they're all alcohol cocktail drinks. Yes. The kids, they had non-alcoholic ones. Sky got this fruit punch one that she immediately spilled, and then the bartender made her another one, and she spilled that one. No way. Yeah, it was crazy. They don't have straws or lids at Disney, which is really obnoxious. That's dumb. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I had like some kind of a milk, blue milky type cocktail. The guy next to me had this one that was a green in this like long skinny glass and it was just bubbling, like boiling. Just constantly? Constantly. For like 20 <laughs> minutes that I was there, this thing was just boiling. I don't know what is in it. Probably dry ice. That's what I thought too. But I'm like, that seems that's not, not safe. safe. <laughs> yeah, that's not safe to put in a drink. Um, it's not exactly like the cantina bar from... Star Wars that I thought it would be like there's no cantina band. It's basically just it's a pretty little space, and they got the it bar looks little, very little, and they got the bar, and then they do have those kind of booths around the outside. Yes. If I was gonna go with kids, you'd want to have one of those booths, but apparently we didn't. You get don't one. get to choose that. No, and they do have like a uh, animatronic robot DJ, but there's no band. How do you no, not it's do the DJ. cantina band? I don't know. I thought that too. I, I was expecting a cantina band. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a, it was a very um, fun atmosphere if you were there with adults. It'd be like fun. The, they're doing but, bar chants all the time. But you have a time frame in there, right? Yeah, I think there's a two drink maximum. Maximum? Yeah, I think it's like 45 wow. minutes or two drinks. I don't think anybody was keeping track. I really don't. Hmm. So that was a fun thing to do. Um, it's just amazing. Like the little details, like everything is perfect. Like everything. Like you would expect if a theme park is going to make a Star Wars land. Yes. And be like, well, I got an idea. Let's make all the trash cans R2-D2s. Yes. No. That's not, not how like they're that. doing this. Yeah. No, it's legitimate Everything world. looks authentic to what you think it should look like. Like even down to the mi most minute lines on the buildings. I mean, it's insanity. That's so cool. Like, I mean, one time we were waiting to go to the bathroom. Cash walks up to the water fountain. And he's taking a drink. I'm sitting kind of around the corner. He runs back. He goes, Dad, an eyeball popped out of the water fountain. One of those. Well, that's what I thought. And I'm yeah. like, what? So I go over there and look. I didn't see anything. I'm like, make it do it again. And he, like, for five minutes, he's trying to make it do it again. It wouldn't do it. And I didn't really notice it. But on the wall, there's, like, this big cylinder coming down to the water fountain. Yeah. That has, it's, like, got water in it. And it, it makes you, I didn't really notice it at first because, obviously, I know it's a water fountain. Right. But if to cash or somebody it's like that's the reservoir for the water for the fountain. water yeah and then occasionally a gigantic eyeball monster will come up out of the water and like move around and look at you <laughs> oh my gosh that's incredible i mean honestly though like the way it's been promoted and the way um i hear people talk about it like that's what i expect now i do expect it to be that good yeah and that perfect um especially for disney like because i know how much money disney has yeah i mean, I guess no I, I don't know how much money disney has i just know that disney owns basically everything now and they are 
producing everything, if they can't put something out of this quality, it would be an extreme disappointment for basically everyone. So if you went there and there was R2 units as garbage cans, yeah. would you come back and say, ah, they kind of... Like you could do it like as just white block buildings with R2-D2 garbage cans and just like people walking around. Yeah. Like, you yes. could do it that way. Why would they... Bleh? Why would they I don't do know. That? You know, <laughs> just, you could do something that's definitely like just very on the surface theme parky. Was there anybody in makeup and like as aliens or is it just no. strictly people? No, they're all people. Oh man, they missed a mark there. Because there's like a resistance sign kind of and then there's... Which is like where the rise of the resistance ride so is. Nobody ran out of anywhere and said, It's a trap. No. no. <sighs> but on the resistance ride there is a Mon Calamari nice. captain. That's good. Who's animatronic. And it's really, really good. Good. Um so anyway, it was great. It was totally you know, I, I had an unbelievable time there. I mean, my expectations were like so unbelievably high. That like I think my head my expectations were too high. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, so you thought you were just going to like but they still have another aspect of this coming out with the hotel. Correct. And that's a whole thing. It's not even I wouldn't even call it a hotel. They're no, it's building like, it more like a cruise. It's like a galactic cruise. Like it's a two night, three day cruise. Right. There is on no land. Yeah, but you don't know that. You feel like you're on a ship. Yeah. In outer space. There is no windows in this building. All the windows are LCD screens that are displaying space and yes. movement. And you're going to see, and, you're, you're, and it's all self-contained. You don't leave there. Yep. And you um, all are, meals are included and everything you do while you're on that thing are experiences that are. And you dress, you dress like a person yeah. in Star Wars. Like they're going to give you a robe and, and when things, you and that's are, all you can wear. When you're ready to go on excursion, you're going to board onto a ship that is going to move oh gosh. and make you feel like you're flying down to a planet. And yeah. when the other door opens on the other side of that ship, you're going to get out to the Star Wars land for the day. This is amazing. And then you're going to get back on that ship at the end of the day. It's that's crazy. I mean, the cost is crazy too, but... What do you think it costs? I read somewhere. Now I can't remember. I think it's... Um, like 200000 Something <laughs> like that? I think it, it, it depends on the size of room you get, obviously. But I, I was oh, reading... Oh, no, I mean like the cost of the... I thought you meant like the cost of building it. That's what oh, I said. <laughs> the cost of building Galaxy's Edge alone, you know, was I know for a fact it was in the billions. Oh my gosh! Uh, because I and I will get into that when we're talking about what we're watching. Isn't this crazy? Because like the government cannot do that. No, like nobody really can do that. Whole countries can't afford to build billion dollar things. Right. And Disney is doing that for your enjoyment. Like for you to come back and talk on a podcast about a... No, no. They're doing it because they're going to make a lot of money doing I it. I understand. But I'm just saying like they're spending billions of dollars for people to walk around. Yeah. To have fun. And experience things. But whole countries can't afford to do that to build up infrastructure and like <laughs> the United States people's <laughs> lives. Yeah, no, I get it. But I mean, it's unbelievable. It's, it was packed and that's the, I mean, the whole time you're there, uh, you know, the whole time you're in Disney in general, you're just like, man, it's so incredible. I just wonder what it'd be like without all these fucking people here. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't overly crowded when we were there. And actually I never found the star Wars area to be that crowded. Surprisingly. Um, that is it's just big enough. That, you know, the crowd flow is decent enough. I still would have figured you'd feel that it was crowded. It wasn't too bad. It really wasn't bad in that Star Wars area. No. Um, there's not a lot of pinch points. They got it designed well. Yeah. No bottlenecks. No, not really. Hmm. It's kind of more like, it's just, it's one big, like, figure eight kind of thing. Hmm. All right. Um, but, you know... I, that's what I'm saying. Like I had my hopes so high that you're like, this is going to be the ultimate experience of my life and you're going to feel like you're in it. <laughs> yes. But and you do, I mean, you, you don't feel like that. You feel like, wow, it's incredible. The attention to detail and how cool this all is, but you're still very aware that you're at Disney world. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? 
And the rides themselves, like actually the Millennium Falcon Smugglers uh, Run Ride, other than the queue line, which is cool, and being in the cockpit and doing that kind of stuff. Like as a ride, it's not as good as Star Tours, which is a ride that's been around since the 80s, which is still an awesome ride. Um, Man, I find it so hard to believe since you're, because it's so interactive, like you have people that are piloting. Yeah, it's definitely gunning and cool. I hate to sit here and be like, they've achieved new levels of things that have never existed and then to be like yeah it was okay yeah and then you come back and shit all over no i'm not shitting i mean it It was ridiculous chris it was incredible incredible i loved it um and you're putting out there to the public like this is all nationwide all i'm saying is that as a ride i actually enjoy star tours better and it's been around for a long time it's actually a similar type of ride it's a simulator ride okay in a cockpit Um, all right yes I actually like I thought I you know it would have been I wasn't the pilot that would have been the cool that's where you get to pull the lever to go into hyperspace and stuff yeah. like that that would have been really cool but did cash do that actually having the little job yeah cash did actually having the little jobs and the buttons to push kind of in I felt like just d- detracts from the experience a little because you're always like trying to figure out what button you gotta hit instead of just like watching, watching. what's yeah. going on that's the one thing um I like to say it in theory Good is idea. unbelievable yes. in practice. You know, it's not as great as it is in theory, but okay. still really fun. Like if you just went on the Millennium Falcon and did the ride and it wasn't interactive, like it would have been, I actually think that would probably would have been cooler just cause hmm. you would have had less. Like if you would have had like a, a droid unit doing that for you would be really cool. Well, that's how star tours is. So you get on a, on a, uh, ship and the thing opens and there's actually C-3PO's on there and there's a droid and they're piloting the ship. Oh, okay. And it I guess I don't remember that. I know I've went on Star Tours before, yeah. but it would have been, what the, would it be now? 12 years ago? The Rise of the Resistance ride though is just like, it's hard to even, it, it's hard to even, first of all, I don't even know that you can really call it necessarily just a ride. Like it's a whole experience. It's just an experience. And it's yeah. unbelievable. And really, honestly, even if, okay, for a day pass to Hollywood Studios, and remember, you got Galaxy's Edge, you got Toy Story Land, which sure. has some good rides in it. Um, well, you said it was dog shit, so. No, it's just really small. They have a little roller coaster. Actually, they have Toy Story Mania, which is one of the best rides in the entire park, but it was actually there before Toy Story Land. Um, it's awesome to look at, Toy Story Land. It's really cool looking. But anyway, they got all that. Um, it really used to be like Hollywood studios. You could, it was like a half day okay. or maybe if you could spend a whole day there. Yeah. But now you almost need two days to do it. Wow. So it's a lot. Yeah. Anyway, it was incredible. Um, everybody should go. Everybody should definitely go. You need to go. I know. I really do. I agree with you, but that was 48 minutes of your time. Oh, man. And that's all you get. Okay. <laughs> We've got more to talk about. Yeah, we do. Uh, real quick, I only have like one little news thing that I wanted to get at, and it was about. So there was a movie Cats that came out that was a Broadway play. Yeah, nobody um, cares about it. Nobody cares about it. All I wanted to talk about is that after eight weeks, it was up for eight weeks and made a total of twenty-seven point two million dollars. I'm surprised it made that much. Really? I mean, that's a super low number. That's total, like not just domestic. Yeah, I know. That's but- worldwide. I heard it was so terrible. I'm surprised it made that much. 27.2. It, it cost like over $100 million to make, right? And who knows what the marketing was. And it was in every theater. Yeah. Everywhere. Everybody got to see well, this it thing. it looked really dumb. And it made nothing. What I heard was it, uh, so the, they like screwed up the CGI and they left hands in. And then they had to go back and try to take hands out. Yeah. And then they I heard the whole thing was kind of a mess. It was just like all of it was really messy. And then they just opted to say, well, like, well, this is what it is. Yeah. And then they put it out. Plus the story apparently was just god awful. Is it just the story of Yes, which is fine to watch on a Broadway play, but as a movie, nobody wants to see that. I don't know what the story is. I don't even know what cats is about besides cats. So Well, it's about cats, Jerry. Yeah, but what do cats do? 
Um, well, that's exactly what it's about. They hate people. They don't that's go what, around you. That's what cats do. Uh, well, it made no money, and nobody likes it. That was my news. <laughs> Next. <laughs> Next. Uh, we uh, watched a bit of a show, buddy. Yeah, I got a bunch of what you're watching, but let's devote the rest of our time to just one thing. Yes. Because it's so relevant. To what we do To here. what we do. Lock and key. Yeah, lock and key on Netflix. If Holy you haven't smokes. been checking out this show, you are just not a very intelligent person. No, you really aren't. Um, even if you... So let's say you're not a big fan of comic books, right? And you don't ever want to read them. Non comic booky though. I get it. I get it. Like you property. don't want to have to read a comic book. This show though is a is not like that. It's not like a comic book. It's it's a good show. And it was a good adaptation, but they took some liberties. Yeah. So um if you guys remember, um we did our was it Top Town Comics for New Readers? I think so. Top, I had it on I my list. I don't know if you 10. had it on your list, but I think I did. It's uh I've always said like it was one of my favorite comic books of all time. Um I might walk that back a little bit. I've reread the entire run. Yes. Now since so we'll talk about that too afterwards. I've reread the entire run now since I've watched the show. But um Um Yeah, I mean it was definitely one. I turned it on and it like I had to binge it. You yeah, have to binge it. You do. And there, I had some problems with it right out the gate. I definitely did. But okay. overall, like I loved it. And I love Lock and Key because um, it's just such an interesting, fun, it's like childlike wonder. It is. You and I, I mean? believe it's set up to be that way. Yeah. It's set up to be. It's like a, um, a fantasy. A fantasy, but it's also like a, um, a childhood, uh, what do I want to call it? It's like, it's almost like one of the eighties, like an eighties. Yeah, but with definite horror, horror vibes. But yeah, and there's some extreme graphic violence. Not in the show as much, but in the comic. Oh, the comic for sure. <laughs> the comic is very, very, very R rated. They took, uh, they took a step back from that to do the show, and I think Netflix probably told them to do that. And I 100 percent think that was the right decision. I agree. Um, I like it in the comic books. I think it's fine. Because it is a comic and you can do that. But for a TV show, I just don't feel like it would work. Yeah. I mean, I, that was my thing. Uh, Especially if you want it to be, you know, a big hit. Like yeah. you're you're really limiting yourself if you go that graphic for a Netflix show. Because um, obviously Netflix, anybody can watch. I don't know, the Boys on Amazon. Yeah, you know, that's you true. You can get away with a lot. these. That's days. true. And we should say in Game of Thrones. But we should say going forward, uh, spoilers on this. Nothing serious. Like, I don't think we'll spoil the storyline. Oh, no. Okay, yes. Yeah, spoilers then. Yeah, because I have some if notes If you haven't here seen Lock gonna... and Key, check it out. We're going to have spoilers going forward for the next little ways. It's going to be spoiled because yes. I wanted to talk pretty in depth about some okay. things. Okay, let's do it. So I'll say right off the bat, though, I, um, I read, watched the show, um, and then reread the entire comic. There's six trade paperbacks yes it's pretty lengthy um it's, it's, it's a, a quick story. read though but there is a lot of reading i i'm gonna be honest like the first three i kind of skim because i've read them yep. multiple times i had never read the last two five or six so i never actually read the end of the story really yeah i don't know you never have before no i think what maybe i was waiting for them to come out or something probably and then i just never got around to it um so I, I also reread the the last five and six. I've I have read it all before. The show is about is really like, first of all, it's not a direct adaptation of the comic. It's pretty close, but there's right. definitely a lot of differences. So they especially changed, towards the end. Yeah, they changed some things because you'd have to to make it an appealing show. It yeah. just doesn't it doesn't directly adapt. Right. Is that the right word? Yeah. Um, and, I mean, and frankly, uh, this is, this will be the controversial opinion. I think I like the show better than the comic. I think this I material I lends itself it like to TV better than it did to comics. Yeah. So here's what I think I like better is that. So right off the bat, there's in the comic book, there's uh, Zach Wells is... Um, 
kind of like the bad guy, right? Like he's yeah. like the woman in Dodge. the well. Dodge. Yes. And I don't like that character as much as I liked the Dodge that they have in the show. I agree 100%. So that the, was a correct decision. I never really... First so, of all, there's way too much there about like setting up the interper, interpersonal yes. romances and between all these people, between Zach yeah. and... Um, you know his friendships with the kids there's just too much there it would have t- it would take too much time i agree and and they did a very good job at cutting that stuff out and putting it all as dodge and lucas you yeah. know like in between there and i thought it was a like and a, it, it, it it lent itself to some surprises and some reveals that you're not really sure of they really tackled that perfectly yeah i completely agree and Here's where they and paid better a little than bit, in the book, I think. They paid a little bit of a, an homage to the Zach Wells character towards the end of the show because they did make Dodge into, um, what's her name? Uh, uh, why can't I think of her name? I have it written down. The girl. Kinsey. Uh, Kinsey's boyfriend, like boyfriend person, Gabe is his name in the show. Oh, right. They right. make him into And that's where it Dodge. diverges though. I mean, that's, I think that's a different storyline than it, anything that was in the comic. It is. But I think like, that's the only way they paid an homage to the Zach Wells character because he was her boyfriend in the comic book. Yeah. So at the end of the show, they kind of say like, well, Hey, we, we know what the source material we're coming from, but the story is going to be a little bit different. Yeah. And I liked that. I think it was good. Well, in two in the book, um, you know, there was a situation where um, the teacher, what's I can't remember his name, but he recognizes Joe Zach. He's like, oh, that was my student from back then. And yeah, that's they why do it he right kills away. him. But in this one, it, he was just he, Lucas. I, the way they did it in the show is much less confusing than the way they did it in the book. Yeah, I agree with you. So I definitely was because a big fan it takes of that. it takes some reading to try to figure that out. Yeah. And that's where you can lose a lot of people. Well, and that's yeah. another thing that I think the show was superior into the book. In the book, um, there is a lot of reading that is unnecessary. Unnecessary. And then also, like, there's some, I don't want to say bad dialogue, but there's a, just a lot of angst and yeah. like a lot of teenager stuff. But. It's like an from adult a point trying of, to yes, be a teenager. Exactly. Yes. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like not what a teenager would sound like, yeah. but there is a lot of that trying to be had. And yes, I feel like they've done a much better job. First of all, they eliminated a lot of that from the show, just in general. Yeah, they eliminated all of that almost Pretty because much. they... Um, and and Bodie, Bodie really isn't like Bodie in the comic book even. Um, he's a little more... He's a little more on the side, almost. Bodhi in the comic book is very present and doing a lot of things and always doing something and getting into mischief and wanting to do things. But in the, the show, he was just kind of like, like I found the keys and I just want to be a part of this. It was more Kinsey and Tyler than it was Bodhi yeah. in the show, which I'm fine with. Um, they've... In the show, they've created some new keys that weren't in the book, and they've also left out keys um, that were in the book. But I do believe they're going to bring in, obviously, more keys as the show goes on. Yeah, th- this is one of my big biggest pet peeves with the show, Okay, um, is that they have chewed through story. Real fast. In one season, you're talking about, you're talking about a, a book that has six trades. They've went through four of them, Mo- at least. Five, like they're cutting actually. into five. Cutting into five they in one season. Yeah, but here's one thing that um, I thought I always liked about the books. Um, first of all, there are more keys, but there will be like randomly throughout the books, just like splash pages that show them on some adventure with yes. a key. And this, then maybe there'll be a couple scenes, the next panel, like there's one where they're fighting like plants. Yes. And then there's like a next scene where their faces are all cut up. My, uh, that's what I wanted to bring up is about the head key. So one of the best splash pages I think I've ever seen and some of the best artwork I've seen is, so in the book there's the head key and in the show they have the head key and you can stick it in the back of your neck, you know, on the back side of your head. 
and turn it and you can see inside of someone's head and what and what they're thinking you can like walk around in your own head with other people um in the comic book they have a splash page where when i don't it's early in the in the book but uh you turn the page and it's a two page spread and it's Bodhi's head and the top of his head o- is opened up and you can see inside of it. And it's like incredible artwork. It's just some of the in- most incredible artwork. And I wanted to see that in the show. I wanted to see like cost a, lot a of shot. Yes. I'm sure it would have. The way they do it in the show is not nearly as cool as in the, I just thought that book. like, if you gave me that one thing, I would have, been all in i mean i'm i'm all in for the show but i just want to see that one thing where his head opens up and you can see inside of Bodie's head and like walk down the stairs into into his mind i that's all you, you didn't need to do it again you didn't have to do that every single time somebody used the key i just wanted to see that one page because i it's really amazing if you do anything i think it's in the second trade it could be in the first trade but either way it's it's, it's definitely not really the first trade it's not the second okay. one is the one with the head key. Okay, so it's in that trade then. Do you know what I'm talking about? That splash yeah. page? Yeah. Well, I don't know if I do specifically because I just reread them all, but I reread them on the panel by panel view. Yeah. So lots of times you don't get the overarching. Oh, okay. You don't well, get that, to see the splash pages a lot. Because I have the the physical copies so do I, of yeah. the first three, I think. I have the first three as well. Um, physical. And when you open it, and the, it's like waxy the the pages themselves are that really high quality yeah. paper, you know, yeah. and you open it up and I don't know, it was just like really amazing. And it took me, uh, it just like took me aback a little bit, like, holy shit, somebody drew this and the detail in it is amazing. Yeah. He had to have spent so much time. They made like a couple differences with the head key. Like it doesn't open up their head like it did in the book. It like opens up a door and they to their mind. In. And then they got away totally with like the little little memory creatures but well no so like kinsey kinsey brings out her fear yeah, in but the that's books a full as a, size thing as a mouth it's like a mouse creature that she yeah. keeps in a jar in her bedroom that's what i mean and then but in the in the show it's, it's a like a legit size, yeah. zombie monster thing so i like the little memory people because i think they're cool yeah but there's no reason to spend the money to do that on the show because it would be cool to do, but I didn't care for like the, the zombie monster fear. I didn't at all. And I didn't really understand. I guess it kept coming back because you, there are points in the show where they cause some damage. But yeah, you have to you have to bring up the fact that she gets rid of her fear. Yeah. You have to bring that up for the story just because that's but see, part there's of a whole character. storyline in the book where her fear gets inside of. Uh, her brother's head yes and then causes him to have like a mental breakdown because he's got like double fear so that's what i thought was going to happen when it attacked him in yeah. the show and i thought oh here we go he's going to like i didn't know what was going to happen like if it was going to go inside of him or if it was going to be like if it cut him if it was a part of him yeah i didn't know how that was going to be because that's the first time you see really inside someone's head besides Bodie's. i'm um, guessing that was just a, a budget thing because that would be really expensive to do yeah. the little things like uh one the one girl um, you know how they take all her memories out yes and they all get buried in the rocks uh, but in the show they, they do. don't do that at all they just lock her inside of her own head which i think was clever i think it's really clever how yeah. they did that and the same with the omega key hiding it inside um randall said or yeah. rendell said yeah that's awesome i think that's really great did they do that in yeah they, they did that they in did. the book too they did i just think it's a really cool like that's really smart yeah yeah, there's lots of, you can see, I mean, you can see clearly there's more stuff from the books they're going to do. Like they're probably going to do the Bodhi possession because yes. they've established that his Sam Lesser's ghost is outside the house. Yes. Um, so they're probably going to do that. They're probably going to do him getting shot and being put in a medicine cabinet. And they'll have to have the, uh, the angel key. The angel key is where they can fly. I don't know if they'll fly. bring that in. I yeah, think they will. I don't think they will. I think it's probably too expensive to do. I mean, if you can have a CGI ghost flying around, why can't you have somebody flying around with a yeah, har- harness thing? So, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff in the books. I, I just think overall, I mean, there's there's definitely some things that are infuriating to me about the show and also about the books, and it's their constant ability to fuck up and lose the keys. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. And then 100%. to also just like not use the keys. They're like never using the keys. They don't like, so what I thought was going to happen when Sam Lesser was over at the house and they hid that key. What originally I thought they were going to do is she was going to use that music box and control him. Of course. Why wouldn't you have done that? Yeah, there's a lot of that kind you of thing. You spent so much time messing around with this girl to dump ketchup and mustard on her head in a lunchroom, but you don't think maybe I could get this guy to drop his gun. Right. Stop attacking us. Like, that was pretty annoying. Um, there's lots of that stuff that happens, though. Yes. That it, like, happens every episode. Something like that happens, and you're just like, what? How did you just get back all the keys and then lose them all immediately? Again. And another thing again i like this show a Loved lot it. Loved and, it, yeah. and i watched it very fast yeah uh, it was when you were gone i and watched I the whole show when, it was good, when you were gone um but there was an uh, another part in basically every single episode where there was like just parts of it where they were not advancing the story at all they were just being like high school kids talking about things that made no difference to anything but that's how and then the all of a sudden too, sometimes and then all of, yeah, i kind of thought you'd get rid of that yeah for a show you know and then all of a sudden they just pick up with something random you know they they went off and did something that didn't make any sense and then they'd come back and be like well we got to find these keys I just i didn't know where they were going with a lot of it yeah there's a lot of like just random just found out you live in a magical house with amazing keys and then you're like, okay, I'm going to school. Like, who am I going to take to the dance? And you're just like, what? Or like he was just so, yeah, like Tyler was so worked up about the, like Jackie and Eden and um, like, I get it. You're going to have a life and you're going to do these things, but. I would I, never leave you, my house. Yeah. Why are you so worked up about having to go to the 5k run? Yeah. Like there's are, freaking people really? trying to kill you. Like right now. Yeah. Like you absolutely know your little itty bitty brother at home that apparently never goes to school uh, is being attacked by this woman in the well. But you're worried about like the party either you're going to go to or the 5K you should have went to. Yeah. And well, I'm just going to get drunk instead because I'm I'm a screw up. Yeah. What are you talking? About? Why are you doing that? You have a lady that could go anywhere in the world at any point in time, literally that has told you, I'm going to kill your brother. That is murdering people. And, well, Jackie wanted me to go 5K. I screwed it up. Yeah. No, that, I mean, that's the book, too, too. Yeah. Also, that is one thing about both that is, it's, it's kind of difficult to wrap your head around at a lot of points. Here's the other thing that I think they changed for the better in the show, though. Uh, is Nina the mom of all of them. So in the books, she's like a very abusive alcoholic person Yeah, that is not a very good mother in the slightest and basically kind of writes her children off because she can't control anything. Um, and in the show, she's still an alcoholic, but like a recovering alcoholic that is uh that like obviously loves her family and uses like their shared experience of the the father's killing as um like something as a bond yeah. basically to them and she knew she could screw up earlier i don't think her character was very good no necessarily in the show i was like, gonna say that like i i didn't think she was good character. no i don't think she was a very good character but i liked that aspect of the mother more so than the abusive i'm going to neglect you type I just don't think it would have translated well for the show. I don't think people would have liked it anyways. So I think they took that as a good, I, I think they took a good route with that character. It just wasn't acted well right. or written well. I just didn't like the actress basically. Yeah, I, I agree. She was very bland. It was like one note the whole time. Yeah. She, she didn't really have, she didn't have a peak to me. I thought she was going to have a peak when she goes over to like Joe's house to try to save him. And I thought she was going to run into somebody and actually have a part in the story. Right. And then she didn't. <laughs> um, so that was, I'm, I'm really, really interested to see where they go from here. I hope they completely diverge from the books because do you, as much as I liked, um, 
the last two trades of lock and key, which I did very much enjoy. Probably is more than the even beginning half of the story. Um, I really like how they ended it in the book. I thought it was great. Yeah. But I don't want to see that on screen. I don't want to see that story play out. I want to see something a little more hopeful. Yeah. Uh, a little less violent, a little more wondrous, a little more fun, um, a little less dark. Okay. That's what I'd like to see from the show. I don't want them. I don't think they're going to. They've done stuff but, at the end of the show that is completely different than the comics. Yeah, they have. 100 You're, degrees different. Yeah, which which would tell you that they're going to do something different in the show. And we'll see. Are they going to do the time key? You know, I don't know. Probably. Because like the, probably the whole will. fifth trade was like all... Time key. Yeah. Time key, wasn't it? Like the whole thing was oh, like yeah. back in... I think they are absolutely going to do that because of the fact of throwing the woman in the... Uh, what was her name? Elise, Elsa, uh, oh, yeah, Elise, right? I don't know. She, they threw her like she was look. She looked like Dodge, but they threw her through the, through the oh, door. Ellie, you mean? Ellie, yeah, yeah, but that's completely different than that. Didn't happen in the book. No, I understand that. What I'm saying is, I think that's how they're going to bring the time key in, though, is to try to intertwine that with it somehow. How? I don't know. I didn't write the story, but I I do think they're going to bring it in somehow that way. Like go back in time and stop themselves. They from doing can't do that. that with the time key. All they can go. Remember, all they do is go back and they can see past events. But they I can't they, interact with them. I thought they could interact with them. No, they go back in time and they're like ghosts and they can witness what's going on in the past, but they can only do it before the year 2000 Bef- because there's no two on the clock. Yeah, 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 yeah. I got you. So they, that's, they go back and they see what happened to Rendell and all, Ellie and all their friends. Yes. That's like the whole That's fifth trade is they see what happens to them in the past. And then for some unbeknownst reason, after knowing all of that in the book, <laughs> yeah, they, st- they still, still continue do. to, well, do they try and open it in the book? Yeah. No, they didn't. I thought they did. Gosh, I can't remember. No, you absolutely do because when they open it in the book, there's way different demons. There's like an eyeball demon. There's like that big eyeball demon thing, and there's like physical demons that want to come out the door. There was no orange bullet. Yeah, there was. No, there really was. Yeah, because that's what they made the keys out of. The demon I don't shot in, and if they didn't attach to a person, they just became this metal clump. And then they forged those into the magical keys. Yes, they came into that clump, but they weren't an orange bullet that just shot out. Like you could see a physical demon inside the like it was like that eyeball. Don't you remember the eyeball? Yeah, things? yeah, yeah. But they were still like the things they shot out were like bullet. Yes, kind of things. And they did open the door to see that. Yeah. Yes, they did. I mean, they did. I'm trying to remember though in the book at the end of the book, who? Oh, they don't open the door. Not at the end. They do it before that, though. No, Rendell and his friends do it. I thought they did it after that. I don't remember. I don't either. And I just read it. I literally read it two days ago. I I can't remember now. (laughs) Um, It might feel like that because they they do a time jump back to Rendell and his friends when they open it. Maybe. Oh, that's what it was. Okay. They, Rendell and their friends. Open the door. They go back in time to like the 1800s and they see what's behind the door. And, and then, then they, they still, still decide to open, open the it. door. Yes, you're right. And not even for good reasons. Like for bullshit it's because reasons. they became obsessed with it. It's because they wanted to make a new key. Yeah. And that's the only way they could get the key. Hmm. Anyway. I, I think I like the direction they're going in the show more, even though they're chewing through a lot of story. But I don't need them or want them to make the same story as the book. Yeah. There's literally... Uh, no like Lovecraftian element to the show right. in the, in the comic book, they talk about Lovecraft, like all well, that's the, the name of the town. Yeah. Well, right. It is. But, and Bodhi talks about it all the time about when uh, he uses the animal key. Isn't that what it's called? Animal key where he changes into animals and stuff. And he always talks about being some Lovecraftian monster that comes out the other side. And then he just, turns out to be a bird yeah because they get an interesting and, turn with Bodhi in the book with the animal key and yeah. the ghost key 
Um, and well, I, I don't think they'll do it in the show, which is fine, but it's pretty cool. It is cool. It is cool. Although I never, I couldn't really figure out exactly what happened. So they kill him or mm-hmm. he's dead. Right. But his ghost is outside of his body because he wasn't in his body. In yet. his body. Yeah. All right. So then the sparrow goes through the ghost thing and then comes out the animal door. No. Yeah. The sparrow goes, goes through, through the, the ghost, the ghost door. door. His ghost goes into the sparrow. The sparrow goes out the animal door and out the other side Bodhi comes. Right, because Bodhi entered the animal door as the sparrow. Well, not he was not before that. He wasn't a sparrow. I mean, he was a sparrow before that. Yeah, but he came back. He was right. He did come now. Back. Not a sparrow when he got his ghost taken out. I'm gonna have to look at that. His again, ghost then. went into the sparrow. The sparrow went through oh. the animal door, and it became him. Which makes sense, I guess. Because he's inside the sparrow then. Because he knew the sparrow. Because before he was I know. a sparrow. Yeah. And he flew with them and they attacked the wolves. The sparrow wanted to go with and his family that all died. Yeah, they murdered themselves or yeah. like committed suicide killing wolves. Anyway, um, it's an interesting <laughs> book. It's a great book. It's really fun to read, uh, but I preferred the show. And I'm interested to see how it goes, and I hope they do a different take on it. I. I'm not going to say which one I prefer. I think they're two different things. They are two different things. Um, that's why I don't want them to share the same story because they're very, very, very different things. Yeah. And and you got to take them as different things. This so story to me... The base of it is the lends same. Lends itself to uh, TV. I agree. And more than comics. We said that when we were reviewing the book Yeah. Uh, as in that uh, podcast. It's an early on podcast. Check it out if you can. Um and that's what we said. Like, if there was one show that I feel like could be made and adapted into a TV show that people would want to watch, it is this. Yeah. And I think they did a very good job at it. it I is, just wish they would have taken all of season one and just had them do adventures with the keys yeah, before they dove I agree. into the story this much. They're like way into the story. Now. I know. And I don't know what they're going to do how, besides you can't, create their own. You can't turn back now, though. Like, you can't do a season two where, like, oh, oh, now we're just going to play around with the keys a little bit. Well, maybe they can because Dodge might be, you know, building something up or doing something. But, I mean, I don't know how they would change that seeing as how it's Kinsey's direct boyfriend now. Right. But it was, too, in most of the books. Right. So, but now there's another one. I mean. See, that never happened in the books. What? There's another one. Did you not notice that in the show? What do you mean? There the, isn't another one. It's the same person. No, no, the girl. What's her name? The hot girl? Oh, yeah. No, yeah, that's right. She, she gets got a infected. bullet. Yeah, you're right. And then they meet each other and eat dinner at the end. Yeah. yeah. They're eating lunch. Yeah. So I don't know what they're going to so do now there. there's two of them. Yep. And that's a new... They're taking a completely different storyline, which is good. Yeah. That's why they could chew through that much story then. They already had it planned out. And Joe Hill is involved with all of this. Right. Joe Hill is is the writer and of Lock and Key. clearly no stranger to movie adaptations. Of Not at all. Written work. Yeah. Because his dad is the ultimate king of TV and movie right. adaptations As of books. As in Stephen King. Yeah. So Joe Hill was in the show. Did you notice him? No. He was one of the paramedics when um, they put, I think, was it Bodie in the in the ambulance? Somebody. It was like uh, one of the very last. Or no. Yeah, Bodie hops in the ambulance with Rufus. Rufus comes in there. He runs in. And the one guy, there was one paramedic who was completely different, uh, says, you are you ready to go, Bodie? And then he just like kind of looks at him. And then it flashes back to the paramedic at the door. And it was Joe Hill. Hmm. And he said, all right, ready to go, and he slams the door. And it was him. I caught it right away. I don't know why, but I did. One thing that, um, since I just recently read The Sixth Trade, um, <clears throat> and it is like an, it's a very graphically violent show, or uh, not show, uh, comic book. Yes. Um, and not like all the time, but like in certain no, places. No, but when they do it, yeah, 
It's like holy. But the sixth shnikes. one, sixth comic trade, and this is a little spoiler. There is like this punishing, punishing moment where Bodhi is taken over by Dodge. Yes. And they're standing at a bus stop. Him and his like little best friend. It's it is, bad. <laughs> I like almost started crying. It was. It's fucking it's, terrible. It's messed up. It's the it's, one part where I can't even imagine writing that. I mean, that's what I was just going to say. It's the one part where Joe Hill or King, whatever you want to call him. Um, well, I'll call him Joe Hill because that's his name. Well, his actual last name is King. His middle name is something different. Like he made that name up. Yeah, obviously. Right. So it's not his actual name. But he wants to be the he wa- He wants to be Joe Hill. Yes. Um, anyway. He like really goes after what his father try, tries to or does do but even like more it's, so like he tries to like one up him on uh, what is going on in this and i don't like it it is hard to handle i don't think it's necessary yeah for the story i mean you can and then there's just like an absolute slaughter fest at the end of that book and you can kill people that's fine i just don't i don't know i don't see why you need to go that in depth with it <laughs> yeah Whatever, it's not my book, and he's got a lot more money than we do, and a lot more stories though. No, I mean, he can write more. Maybe that's what makes it so powerful. But that scene, then coupled with, and then they like it doesn't end because then they're like at the funeral. It's a whole thing. It's it's horrifying. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. it's unbelievable. (laughs) I, and I think he was trying to build it up as like this huge climactic ending. Yeah, and it was. It felt like that. It absolutely felt the that way. The comic just... felt is very, very, like, the last two, which, ironically enough, are the ones I had never read. Um, it's just, like... Are intense. It's They're very intense. Whereas the first one is very fun, kind of. Well, no, the beginning of it's pretty gory violent. Because um, there's a lot they didn't do with, like... Yeah, there's so much they didn't do. Yeah. I mean, and how could you? How could you with... I mean, even with 10... 49 minute episodes just the other thing so about stuff it, to cover about it being on a show is like it's a complicated narrative mm-hmm. to do in a comic like because there's a lots of elements with all these different keys and what they do that it's hard and to each individual character it's a lot easier to show it yeah than it is necessarily to do it in a comic so that's why i think it lends itself really well but like i said i you know, I always looked at those splash pages of them using these other keys that you never hear about. I'm like, what about that key? Like, mm-hmm. I want to, I want to know about that key. Like, I want to see that adventure. Yeah, and that could be an episode of a show. It could almost be like a key of the week yeah. show. You know, it really could. But you know, that's not the way they're doing it, which is fine. Yeah, it it is a very Netflixy show. You yeah. know, like uh, the way it felt it like is. Umbrella Academy in a lot of ways, but better. I was gonna. I was going to talk about that. I forgot about it. I'm glad you said it. Is Was that this film the same? It feels like it's the same budget range. Yes. It feels the same as Umbrella Academy, but bet- it is way better. It doesn't leave you wanting as much. Oh, it's as not what, slow either. Yeah. As like Umbrella Academy, like Umbrella Academy at the end of the show or at the end of each episode, it made me want the story. Yeah. You know, because it was somewhat slow and it's like, come on, can you advance something? This was not that way. I mean, it advanced so much so fast that I I had a hard time keeping up. Yeah. Yeah. Like with everything that they were going through. Yeah. So, but it's a very good show. Check it out if you can. Um, If it's anything you think you'd be interested in, even if you don't think you're interested in it, I would say watch it because I bet you you are. Yeah, for sure. Um, Anything else you've been watching? Um, so there was, uh, let me, let me read this real quick. Okay. So there was a guy on, uh, Joe Rogan and I, I put this as I'm watching it because I did watch it on YouTube because he puts all of his stuff on YouTube, which we do as well. YouTube.com slash Joe Rogan number 1425. He had Garrett Reisman Reisman. He was an astronaut. Um, and no, was this the astronaut guy? He had an astronaut on there too. This is a guy that, yeah, he was an astronaut and he works with uh, SpaceX 
Um, but he also worked with NASA, obviously, as an actual astronaut. Um, he was up in space for 95 days. And he said, he's like, on your, he's like, it was really shitty because on your 100th day, you get a patch to go on whatever you want to wear. It says you've been in space for 100 days. He's like, and they just, he's like, you don't know it when it happens. They just tell you one day, like, you're coming back. Uh, and he's like, and we got a shuttle came in with some supplies and the guy came off and he's like, Oh, Gary, you're going home today. He's like, what? It's like, yeah, you got it. You're, you're done. Go home. He's like, it's 95 days. Can I just like stay for five more days? They're like, no, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> and he had to leave uh. and he was super mad about it. But anyway, um, he, if you're interested in space at all, or if you're interested in like, astronauts at all this guy lays it all out for you i feel like he was a better like astronaut to listen to than that um mike uh there I, was a couple of them there's the one guy there's like the one that's from like canada the head of what's his name the guy from canada everybody knows him and i'm sure you've seen him he sang in space he showed everybody like he's shown everybody a lot of stuff but listening to this guy talk about what he did and the experience of living in space and what it, the effects on your body um, were, were just really cool. Like you don't think about any of this stuff. So like the effects on your body in space are pretty terrible, especially if, you know, they've got it down now where you working out in space will help uh, decrease the effects of it. So, you know, obviously muscle loss, but bone density is affected terribly in yeah. space because like what he said was you're a bot your body immediately starts to change because you don't have to support the weight of yourself anymore so you're he said it's and it was a really cool um way of explaining it he's like think of a fish he's like your body's basically trying to turn into a fish because fish don't have to support their weight they have bones in there and it supports their body. But they do have to it, support pressure. St structurally wise, it supports you, but it doesn't support physical weight bearing like right. your bones are designed to do now. Like your whole skeleton is designed to support your weight standing up. Once you go into space, it's unnecessary for it to do that. You're going to keep all those bones, but the density of them and their actual like purpose changes. Why? Why does it change so quickly though? Your I, your body immediately starts taking away from that, and I he said, "I don't. Though. I don't. Make any sense. There's no need for it." It. He said that there are. He, he talks about it in the, in the episode, and he said the constant impact from you walking, right, sends signals to your body to keep your bones a certain strength to support that impact all the time. As soon as that stops, those impulses stop and your body no longer sends that to your, to you, through your body and it stops sending the nutrients and whatever else needs to be in your bones to keep them the same way. And it, then it sends it to other places because you're using other things differently. And so your body starts to eat away at your bones because you don't need them anymore. Hmm. Like for what your, your purpose is until you come back to space. Andy said when he first went to space, um, he said your heart is constantly trying to pump blood like down to your legs. You're trying to move everything down your body, you know, and move it away from the heart. He said, but in space, uh, you don't need to do that anymore. He said, and it feels like you're basically standing on your head for the first day until you get used to it because everything just like – instead of pooling in your legs when you sit down like we are right now, like your blood is pooling in your legs and your blood's, your heart's trying to pump it to where it comes back up right. towards the heart. It doesn't need to work that hard anymore, and but it still thinks it does at first until it realizes like, oh, I don't need to do that. So at the time, it just keeps pushing everything up towards your head. He's like, and it, he's like, I got up there and I felt awful. He's like, because I thought I was like hanging upside down all the time. He's like, and my face was puffy, like swelled up, and my eyes were like puffy and uh, bloodshot. And he's like, and I just had a, like a head rush all the time. And then you eventually get used to it, and it goes away. Hmm. Um, 
Anyway, that was ex- his experience in space. And then he did uh, spacewalks too. He's short. He's 5'4". So <laughs> more power to you. I could do spacewalks. There's probably not a lot of tall astronauts. All of them are bigger than him. He said he was like one of the shortest to ever do spacewalks. And he said he had a, he came in and wanted to, you have to like apply to be an astronaut that does a spacewalk because the suits are made specific sizes. Yeah. And that's it. They're like a, it's like a one size fits all. Right. And you can have it somewhat adjusted, but there's very little adjustment you can make because it has to be a certain structure. And, uh, so he came into the school like requesting that he wanted to do spacewalks and this big tall astronaut guy told him you're never going to do it he's like you're too small he's like as soon as you get in the suit he's like you're going to have too much room and you're going to be working so hard inside the suit to position yourself to do the work that you're never going to do it so he said the first time he got in a suit to do the work he said he failed miserably and he was right he's like at first he was right he's like i I was working way too hard and I couldn't do anything. Um, He's like, but then after that, I went and talked to the people that made the suits. He's like, and they adjusted a few little things for me here and there. And I got in the suit and then he passed and he got to do spacewalks. He's like, and the tall guy that told him that he couldn't do it, never got to do spacewalks, didn't (laughs) pass. So he went out there and did a couple uh, like big missions out in space and whatnot. But when he came back, he started working for SpaceX with... uh, What's his name? Elon uh, Musk. Yes, Elon Musk. He owns Tesla. Yeah. But anyway, and he also owns SpaceX. And their stock is wild right now, man. It is. It's they, way up. So with SpaceX, he's talking about the different uh, type of spacecraft they're using and the landers they're starting to build and different things. And he, he said the year 2020 is where everything's going to change for space travel. He said uh, SpaceX and then Boeing has their own um, yeah. company that they're doing. And Amazon also does. Yeah. He said, and somehow he's like, this was not planned this way, but he said somehow all three of these companies are going to have huge like milestones this year where they prove that you are going to be able to take anybody out into space. And basically he's like guaranteed travel to Mars. He's like, it's, it's amazing. All of these to things are going to happen this year. That the only reason this is happening, it's just like a perfect picture of how terrible government is. Yeah. So he talks about that too. He's and he says like the company, the the privatized companies that he works for now, they also like those companies still work for NASA. Oh yeah, for sure. And NASA had private companies build things for them. It's just that NASA's specs were so, uh, like you had to go by what NASA said so much that it made it harder to create the product cheap. Well, and the layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy. Exactly. And that's what it was that's from. That's the issue. That's, I mean, that's, that's the issue with government from 100% top to of bottom. It yeah. That's why we spend twenty thousand dollars per student right. on public education and get some of the shittiest results in the world. It's because of the layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy. It's not because we have bad teachers. So and here's the thing too though, is that these companies that are building this, like SpaceX and Boeing and Amazon, they still have to go by the tolerances and specs that NASA puts forth yeah. to travel in space. And he said and they give you a book. It's like it's like this thick of what you the all the qualifications and things you have to meet for your spacecraft in order to even be registered and be able to, to fly the thing. He's like, but within that booklet, you can interpret it the way you want. He's right. like, it's not the way NASA tells you to interpret it anymore. You can interpret it the way you want as long as you're within a certain standard. Yeah. And he said, and from there engineers and and whoever can go wild on what they create because there's no limit after that and you can make anything you want which is what spacex is doing and he said he's like basically in the year 2020 is where space travel for humans really begins and he's like obviously we've been going in space he's like but it's been so restricted so now this year is where it really begins he didn't really go into what spacex is going to do um, well, they just announced the other day they're going to start doing uh, 
tourist flights. They are, but they're taking uh, they're taking people from NASA first, so they have to take up, and they're already astronauts, but they're taking up a certain amount of astronauts that have already said they, they would do it, they've agreed to it, signed a contract, that would go up in space, and they have to take those people up first and prove that all of that is successful um, before they take paying customers right and it's still incredibly dangerous i'm sure it's, but from the sound of it it's really not well i mean sure it's more dangerous than taking an airplane from you know illinois to florida would you go but i mean i'm not leaving my family to do that right now no so like if you could go tomorrow on a safe uh week-long excursion into lower earth orbit uh, would you I might, do it? I might do that. I mean, if, if I could afford it. Well, say you won a contest. I think I would. Like, say it was a little bit risky. I mean, everything is risky. You'd have to give it to me in like, is it as safe as a normal flight? Is it more riskier no, than no, a no. normal flight? It's riskier flight? than a normal flight. It'd be more like, um, it would be risk level... Uh, Base jumping. Risk level base jumping. No, I don't think I would then. I'm not a skydiving. Base... I would do it at skydiving. You do it at skydiving level. Do you know how few people die at skydiving? Yeah. I'd I mean, I do a skydiving. Thousands and thousands I wouldn't of people do, that jump. Like, I, have, I would have no issue doing skydiving. Um, I wouldn't do it now that I have a family with small children just because it's unnecessary. I don't yeah, need to I do agree. it that much. I don't think, I think it, when it's well done, it's probably not super risky. Yeah. It's but my really point not. is, like, I don't have a desire to do it that trumps any level of risk. So I don't have a desire to do skydiving in any level of risk. That's what but, I'm talking about, but skydiving. To, yeah. But to go I into space. I do have space, a desire, yeah. To, but to go into space and then look down and see the earth that you live on. Yeah. I would, I would, I would want I to do I think I would it. do that. If it was within the relative means of safety, I would I would do it. Yeah, so, I mean, you know what's way more dangerous than skydiving, probably, just like snow skiing. Oh like, yeah, people get killed or maimed every day. <clears throat> That's also like you got to take in like probability and like the number of people that are doing it. That's like right. a s- stats thing, though. Yeah, the thing about space is like all this trash, man. All the space trash. Tons of it. It's a big problem. It's a huge problem. There was somebody saying that's what SpaceX is doing, though, is that everything is so reusable. Everything. So they're saying like the the drag. It's a um, SpaceX Dragon something. That's the new one that they're going to launch that carries people up, and that he said should be able to do a hundred flights. No, but I'm With saying no like, problem. What, what about all the debris? But the debris is caused by things that they don't reuse. But they say like a paint chip <clears throat> at the velocity that it is in orbit can puncture a hole in the spaceship. Like you yeah, can't, it can. But and then there's like, but have I you mean, seen this clouds of the space? Like there was, I was listening to something the other day that was like you know, within 10 years, we might not even be able to travel into space anymore because it'll just be closed off by all the garbage. But I mean, if it was that prevalent right now, how is it that we constantly send people? I don't know. Supposedly they track all that stuff, but like, how can they track a paint chip? So here's what I was going to say is that like, even, I mean, what's painted that goes up there? You don't have to paint any of it. I know. I'm saying the paint chips that are already up there. What are they painting in space? Well, no, it comes off of a shuttle or something. How? Just comes off. It's a chip, a Dude, paint chip. So paint just falls off things randomly. Well, I'm, they're up there. I've never seen paint fall off my truck. Sure. Paint falls off stuff. Mm, not really. It has to, Something has to make it fall off, Chris. And just going up in space doesn't. Coming back from space would because of the re-entry to your Tiny orbit. debris chipped a window on the space station. Um, the big thing is like timing, I think, and traveling in a certain orbit that you're either out of where it's going to go or you're with it at the same speed. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, that's probably true. So because the thing in space is like once it's on a certain tra- trajectory unless it hits something it's not going to change. 
So, according to Wired magazine, an orbiting paint chip might not be thought of as a threat to a space shuttle until one considers that it might be trucking along at speeds beyond six miles per second. Shuttle orbits are littered with such tiny but potential deadly objects, and a new report from National Research Council aims to throw more light on the issue. Um, Anyway, I don't know what this is trying to get at because now they're talking about orbital. Never mind. Okay. Well, even things anyway. on the order of a centimeter in diameter that cannot be tracked can cause catastrophic damage. Yeah. Very small things. Because he said that the space shuttle itself is traveling at 17,000 miles an hour in orbit around the Earth. So when he went out on a spacewalk, he's traveling at 17,000 miles an hour separate from the space shuttle itself, which is incredible. Hmm. Um, but what he said was like the star Trek future that you think of is absolutely possible now. Like from this year on is going to set a course to do that. But Mars is a long ways away. It, but he said within a decade, we will go to Mars and back. Nah, he says it on the show. No way. Within a decade, Mars is, is possible is what he's claiming because of what they've already invented. They just haven't put it in. It's so far away. They've already got a reusable fuel besides hydrogen. So hydrogen is good, but it causes so much water. They don't want to use it. And you can't recreate hydrogen on Mars, but the new fuel that he was talking about, and I don't remember what it was. It's a chemical. We all or a, uh, a molecule that we all know. Hydrogen. No, I don't think it was. I, I don't remember what it was, but it's you can create it on your own and create a fuel plant on Mars. So he said, we can go there, create our own fuel to get back because the whole problem was you couldn't create or you couldn't carry enough fuel to get to Mars and back. They could already get to Mars now if they wanted to. Oh, yeah. Just can't get back because you don't have enough fuel. So he said this fuel, although it's less efficient, uh, than hydrogen is. Hydrogen is a better source of fuel. You can go further on less, but once you get there, you can create your own fuel and store it. You could basically get there, store your own fuel, and be able to travel back. What about the solar radiation belt? So he talks about that too, but they have that all timed. But radiation basically um, is always an issue, and you basically have to just try to prepare for it with almost like an aluminum foil coating right away. And you have to, he said there's suits that they already have on the space station themselves that are basically a tin foil suit that when you, when they tell you that a solar flare or any source of radiation is coming towards you, you have to put this over you. He's like, and it could be for an hour. It could be for five minutes, but they tell you it. Um, but there are, yeah, there are like sources of radiation that have come off the sun before that they've just missed, like literally just missed in calculating that could have killed all of them. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> Isn't that nuts? So yeah. I, I thought that was really neat. If you want to watch it, it's Joe Rogan uh, podcast number 1425 Garrett Reisman. Really cool. Cool. Um, along those lines, uh, I've had a couple shows I've been watching. Um, but I will mention one, um, real quick. Cause I, I know we had a listener that was asking about it. Uh, Avenue five, I think it's what it's called. Um, on HBO. Oh my gosh. I can't believe I'm blanking on Avenue five. Anyway, it's that, uh, new show with, uh, Hugh Laurie. Oh, the space show. Yeah. Avenue five. Um, oh. cause they're in space on a space cruise. I haven't watched any of it. Um, I'm really, really enjoying it. I like it a lot. It's a dark comedy which I enjoy very oh, yeah. much. Yeah, so do I. Dark comedies. I, Who doesn't? And I told him too, I said, you know, it's not like the greatest thing in the world. I wouldn't say like it's a it, it's a can't miss um, show, but I really enjoy it. It's got Hugh Laurie in it, who I love. It's got Josh Gad in it, who I also really, I like, really like. And um, I think it's really funny. They're on a space cruise um, around, I think it's around one of, the, one of the moons of Jupiter and back. Okay. And um, they have a little mishap and it throws them off course. So instead of being home in like a matter of a month, they're not going to get home for three and a half years. They end up dying. No. <laughs> so, uh, and Hugh Laurie, who's the captain of the ship, like you come to find out, he's not. He's just an actor they hired to be the captain oh, of the ship. Oh, my gosh. Spoilers. <laughs> well, I don't think that's... It's a comedy, so... Yeah, really. I get it. 
Um, anyway, I'm really enjoying it. I think it's really funny. I love a good dark comedy. So between that and Curb Your Enthusiasm on right now, um, which has also been great this season. Yeah, um, yeah HBO's been knocking it out of the park. Cool. I did watch a, a, a really interesting two documentary. Did you? Uh, M- who's it about? I don't know. Do you have one as well? I do. Okay. No, you're probably not talking about the same one. Uh, mine was on Disney Plus, and it's called Imagineering. Oh, no. I definitely didn't and watch And it. it's like an eight-part <laughs> documentary series about the Walt Disney World Imagineers yeah. and how they created uh, Walt Disney World and the various rides and parks. Years ago, I watched a... Uh, a show about them, but it was on the History Channel. History Channel used to have Modern Marvels. Yeah, you remember that show? Mm-hmm. They had a whole modern Modern Marvels show about Imagineers. It's a ama- it's a unbelievable. First of all, there's like eight episodes, and they're each like an hour and a half long. So each one's like oh a movie. my gosh. Um, this is on Disney Plus. Maybe they're an hour. I don't know. They're long though. Yeah, it's on Disney Plus. It's a, one of the original content they launched with, but I never wow. like watched it because I'm like meh. Yeah, I saw it on there, too, and I've never done anything. But then somebody told me they had a whole episode on Galaxy's Edge, so I watched that. So I started watching it from the beginning. Anyway, it goes all through the history of Walt Disney World and Walt Disney himself and the parks and all that stuff. And I just got totally sucked in, uh, totally binged it. Absolutely amazing. You realize all the amazing cutting-edge stuff they've done, and you get behind the scenes on all of it and how it all works. And the, the structure and the companies and the... Uh, Walt Disney, like through the years, the different CEOs and um, how they either fostered um, the Imagineers to like push forward creatively Mm -hmm. or they like pulled back and started treating it like a business, like a different different person became running it and then the whole company started to fall and then they had to get a better, you know, CEO that Hmm. gave the power back to the creatives and then the company took off again. There was like a real dark period in the 90s when things were not going right at all. Um, But it also shows you all some of these parks that they've created in other countries. So like the ones in Tokyo. Oh, yeah. um, And they're just like incredible looking. And it just like, first of all, I didn't realize, like I always just thought like the parks, like Walt Disneyland and Disney World, we're just like an offshoot of what of like not their main business like their main business was the movies okay and then they just like had theme parks weren't the movies based off of the theme park no definitely not you can't do that you can't you can't do disney that. can <laughs> oh yawning yeah i know um no uh definitely not the theme parks didn't it come until later um but it's like a huge part of their business. It's like the majority of their business is like the theme park business. And I didn't realize it's so that. huge. Yeah. So anyway, it was super good and super interesting. That's all. I would definitely, definitely, definitely recommend it. So I took a dive uh, back in time. Basically, it seems like back in time for me because I haven't watched it in so long. Uh, but I got back on Hulu and I've been watching some shows that I haven't before. And one of them that we've talked about recently is Hell's Kitchen. Hell's Kitchen is an incredible show that I think everybody should waste time and watch if you enjoy cooking, I guess. But I enjoy cooking and I also enjoy people yelling at each other and never getting along and arguing about things that don't make any sense to argue about. And I've been watching season 17. It's an all-star season where they brought back people from different uh, seasons to compete against each other. And gosh, I'm just obsessed with it right now. I've been watching the crap out of it because it's just so fun. And I, I always watch Hell's Kitchen. I haven't, um, I, don't, I mean, I haven't seen every season, but I always like that show. I haven't seen every season either, and I didn't see this one. And then when I saw it, it was an all-star cast of people that have been on before, I was like, well, I have to watch that. And I started it, and it's amazing. Yeah. It's so worth it. I've been watching uh, a lot of 24 Hours to Hell and Back. See, Gordon I, Ramsay's new show. I haven't really got into that that much. I mean, I've watched it. I like it. It's okay. I like it. It's not as good as Kitchen Nightmares, but it's, it's good. It's not a Kitchen Nightmares to no. me. Yeah. First of all, the businesses don't look like they're struggling quite as much. Right. And they all they do is come in and change the seating around, paint the walls, and say, like, don't cook that fish anymore. Yeah. You know, like make a nice meatloaf. The and last episode was the ditched. first one where they came back like two months later and everything had fallen apart. 
Oh, really? The rest of them have been like good. Hmm. Like two months later, like we're doing great. Or whatever, three months later, however many months later. But yeah. Anyway. Um, so I watched that. And then the do- the only other documentary or the only other thing really I've watched in the last few weeks is, uh, I hate to say it, but it's the Taylor Swift documentary that's on Netflix. Oh, I've heard uh, pretty terrible things about it. It is interesting to say the least. So I've heard it's like super self-absorbed and like, like exact ridiculous. Word, that's exact words I was going to say. Like, I get it that you're rich and famous and I get it that you're still a real person, but the real person you're trying to portray yourself to be in this documentary is not true. Yeah. You, she cares. She acts like she cares about everything in the world all the time. And the only, it didn't bother me that much. Like I was, what really struck me, and that I liked about the show is that it gave you an insight of her creating music, like legitimately writing songs and like talking to a guy face to face. And they're like, and you could hear like the songs that have been out on the radio for a couple of years now of her, like piecing it together, you know? And I like that. I like seeing that creative side where it's just being brainstormed. And then a guy says one word and then she's like, Oh wait. And does a whole chorus you know out of that one thing a guy says and then they do the guitar line and create a song it's amazing i like that part of it and then all of a sudden it turns into i don't agree with trump and i don't agree with this person and i don't think this person should do this and it gets super like uber political towards the end where she starts taking a stance um on certain things which you can take a stance on whatever you want it's just that i thought this was more about like well, I, you the, and music. The trailer is so ridiculous because it's basically like her. The trailer alone is, and I, I haven't seen it, but it is one hundred percent positioned as like I was like forced by producers to be one thing my whole life, and like held back and smile and be happy and be pretty. And I'm just like, first of all, stop right there. Yes, you're you- a billionaire. And you chose to do this. And you're a billionaire because of it. You're the most successful musician probably in the history of fucking Almost music. Almost ever, yes. And so like, so you had to smile and wave and not give your opinion. And then she's like, but at some point you got to stand up and you got to say what you mean. And then it's like her saying like, and, I don't like Trump. And everybody's just like. And it came, no, and it actually wasn't actually Trump. It was over... Um, what what was it? It was like a senator that was against something. It was something for women's rights, and yeah, it wasn't. Oh yeah. It wasn't actually against women's rights. It was like one certain thing that she didn't agree with, and it was in Tennessee, her home state. And she said that they want to vote in this Republican woman who was against a certain bill that she said was repealing everything for women women's rights. That's what she understood it as. Um, and so the the whole second half of this documentary is about her deciding. And this is, this is how self-absorbed and ridiculous it was. But again, she does have a huge social media presence, right? Yeah. And anybody's going to like flock to that. But the whole thing leading up to this was like, I have to be, I have to, uh, say what I need to say about this. And I have to have a certain stance, but why I believe in this and I have to say something And her dad and a bunch of other people were completely against it. And they're like, leave it alone. Don't do this. Stop what you're doing. And then she had like a crying fit and said, I'm going to do this. And then it ended up being like the climax of all this, where she's going to take this big stance was her sitting on a couch in her pajamas at like five o'clock in the afternoon and had some girls over and they were drinking wine and she sent out a tweet and that was her stance. I'm going to send out a tweet that says, I don't agree with voting for this and this. That was it. And once I saw that, I was like, you have got to be kidding me. Like you think this is you being like a big woman's rights activist now, all of a sudden, 
Like I'm positive with the money that you have and the capability of your like whole business. I'm positive you can make a better change than just sending out this one tweet and then going to the next shows and saying voting is important. You can make a change. Make sure you vote. And then what making a else whole documentary you patting yourself on the back about it. What else are you doing? Like nothing. You've done nothing to advance anything that you want, even though you believe in it. You have done nothing to help yourself besides saying, I've got a huge social media presence. And I think I can change people's minds. And maybe you did to a 13 year old, but guess what? They can't fucking vote. (laughs) (laughs) Like that's, you didn't, you didn't do anything and you continue to not do anything to actually help someone. Right. Like the, I just, and, and I don't mean to bring it up about money all the time. I understand that super rich people can't just all of a sudden start throwing their money away to whatever they want. It doesn't work that way. I get that you have to be conscious of where your money goes because it can go away pretty quick. Yeah. You know, if you make wrong decisions, I get that, but you can also be conscious of putting a substantial amount of money towards something that you want to work and you think will, will actually make a difference. You can focus on that one thing and make it work. Right. And Instead of just saying, like, I'm going to make this stance and hopefully people will change stuff. I, you know, to me, it's just like the whole arrogance of, like, it's I'm going to arrogant. do very this arrogant. thing and then I'm going to make a whole documentary to pat myself on the back about the thing I did. Right. And at the same time, it's like, well, first of all, did you even do anything that's that controversial? To her, it was. Yeah, I mean, so A, that... Because the, her argument was that throughout her whole career, everybody has said, do not take a stance in politics. Do not do this. Do not do that. And there was always speculation that she was somewhat conservative because of the family she grew up in, the area she grew up in in Tennessee. It was a conservative area. So she was kind of shadowed if as If anybody this believed that she was conservative, and then that's insanity. She lives in Hollywood. Now she does, but I'm saying like her growing up, they just assumed that she would grow up being a conservative, which maybe she did, but now she is certainly not. And which is, I mean, understandable. I makes get it. perfect sense for her. Yeah, I, I guess I could understand from that perspective. You know, you know, growing up in that, and then being a country music icon. And then becoming whatever she is now and then like realizing. And they used in the. It's just so like on like you just have no concept of reality. Reality. And what normal people are doing. That's exactly what I thought because she used Dixie Chicks as an example or they I shouldn't say she but the documentary used uh, the Dixie Chicks as an example of ruining your career. Yeah they had one taking song, a stance though. on politics. They had one or two songs. I mean they weren't. Anywhere near the level that she's at, not even close, not even close to the level. And she's at. That. they and had a they had an album, they had a bunch of songs. They had a bunch of songs, but they were not to the level of what Taylor Swift is beloved. at right now. You know, they weren't pop stars. She, she's, she's a pop star. She's transcended multiple genres of music right. over the decade and a half of her career. Here's the real, like, here's the real rub on this whole thing. It's like you've been told your whole life to not take a stance. And to smile and wave. That is still the correct course of action. Like, and I agree with that. It's just that she, but just my point is she thinks she has no control over her livelihood, even though you've got so many millions of dollars right now. Why can't you be the one that controls whatever you want? But also just don't give your opinion because Ultimately, like the people that are telling you, like, don't take a stance, they're probably saying it for business reasons. You don't want to alienate 50% of the audience. I get it. But the reality of the situation is don't take a stance because who do you think you are? Like, don't think you're that important. Just do your job. You don't have to have a political opinion. I want you to write songs and sing them to me. And why can't that be enough for you? Exactly. Isn't that what you sought out to do? Support your charities, support your organizations, 
With, and, without a documentary saying that you're going to do that. Like, you can absolutely write songs about whatever you want to write songs about. Write a song about the politician that you didn't care for her voting, you know, like what she voted on. And make your songs like political all of, of a issue, sudden if you want to. How big of an to. issue was this? I never even heard about it, so <laughs> not much. It didn't it didn't change anything. Anyway, that yeah, that I I saw it. It's fine. Like I said, the behind the music part of it, I really enjoyed. Actually, I mean, I don't I'd like to see it. I'm uh, I'm not I'm against Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift at all. I like yeah, Swift. I, I've liked I've a lot of her liked songs. Her music. I think she's a very good. Writer I don't really like her anyway. new non. I liked her old that old CD. Yeah. If you sing Tim McGraw. No, not that one. The very first one. That's not her, that like, one. very first song. The one's like, you belong to me. It's you only like a year later. That one. I like that one. That CD. Oh. The whole what, CD, though, is good. What about that one that goes like... Uh, uh, I, don't know. <laughs> I can't even remember it anymore. I was just um, going to say. I don't know. But anyway. Okay. Well, I have a bunch more what I've been watching, but I think we're out of time. We basically are. Um, pretty much. I watched a couple of movies, but nothing that we can't wait on. Oh, I did too. And I forgot to talk about the one. I don't oh. think we can talk about it. No, now. I know we can't. <laughs> Dang it. Um, what is it? I want to hear what it is. Just It case. is a little movie made by Ryan Johnson called Knives Out. Oh, we can't talk about that. I need to get in depth on it too. Okay. So well, many things. Maybe in a future about. episode because I haven't seen it yet. So, okay. And I don't want it spoiled. Oh, you want me to spoil it, you said? No, I do not. Oh, want listen, who done it? I'm going to tell you who done it. <laughs> it was Mr. Green with the crowbar in, in the, the study conservatory. Oh, you're right. Conservatory. <laughs> All right. Well, I think that's it for this week. Uh, make sure you check out uh, snarfcomics.com slash madness or go to snarfcomics.com and click madness in the top. Um, to get your Snarf Madness 2020 bracket. We're doing best comic book characters. Obvious that you slew, all know and are beloved. A slew of prizes. Um, your goal, of course, is to match me or Jerry's bracket. They are due by before March 6th. So you yeah, got like, like two that. weeks left to get those in. Um, if you're going to be at C2E2 next weekend, uh, we'll be walking around. So try and find us. Otherwise, uh, visit... Eric Macias, who's going to be in a booth doing caricatures. You can just ask for him by name and follow him on Instagram at E M A N M A C I A S dot, uh, not dot com. That's just, no, just at, there's no dot coms on Instagram. Iman Macias. Yes, that is correct. Um, and make sure to check out patreon.com slash narc comics. That's what I was going to say. If you haven't already check out our Patreon, yeah. because we would love to have you as a patron. Yeah. We give you bonus podcast content. Um, we've been re- pretty good about releasing content pretty frequently. Yeah. I so. need to put out some more script pages coming out. Um, probably tomorrow. I think I'll throw those out tomorrow. Um, we've had a f- quite a few episodes out so far of our like behind the scenes kind of stuff of snarf talk. Um, but I'm going to put out some script pages from our, um, uh, comic book that we wrote called fourth Reich. Yeah. Uh, I've put out four or five pages now. I'll put out a couple more tomorrow, which would be Friday, the day this comes out. And we're going to throw up on the Instagrams and the Facebooks. That's at snarf comics. We'll be putting out that bracket. Yep. Um, so you can get it there too, but you can always go to the website and get that as well. And for uh, Snarf Talk this week, I've been Chris. I am Jerry. See ya.